When I was a young Christian, and uh, as I've already shared, I became a Christian when I was about 20, and so I was playing catch-up big time, and I used to start going to this youth fellowship, at which I was one of the older ones, <laughs> uh, ironically. They were sort of mainly in their upper teens, and there's me, like a year or two older. There's always one, isn't there? And it was me. And we used to sing these really archaic songs, yeah? Because, I don't know about you, I'm a fan of the modern worship song. And uh, I, I much prefer to sing songs that were written this century. Do you know what I mean? So, like, 1999 is pushing it, yeah? And back in the day, back in the 1980s, which some of you won't remember, you're too young. Um, and I joined this, like, youth fellowship, and we used to sing some songs there from a book called Sounds of Living Waters. Do you remember that one? You wouldn't use it now. You might have a copy in your house somewhere, but uh, ooh, it had, to, had some, some, some real clangers in it. It really did. But uh, there was one that isn't a clangor, actually. It's quite a nice song, but we don't really do it anymore, called Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. Well, in this youth fellowship I used to go to, we had an unofficial fourth verse. And it went, Because you are so lukewarm, Neither hot nor cold. Get ready. I will vomit you out of my mouth. Hallelujah. <laughs> that was the only point I was going to make, but as it turned out, it turned into an epic. All right. And we used to sing this, and I used to think that last verse is a bit weird, isn't it? But that is the bit that's in Revelation chapter 3. And rather confusingly, as we were singing that, it, it said that line, which Jesus said, Knock and the door will be opened to you. Now, that's not from Revelation 3, because in Revelation 3, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. There's a lot of knocking going on, but it's a bit confusing as to who's doing the knocking and who's opening the door, right? So, Jesus himself said, if you're looking for the kingdom, then ask and you'll get it. More about this next week. I'm actually preaching on this next week. But in Revelation, he said, I'm standing at the door knocking. It's me who's doing the knocking. You lot gave up knocking long ago. So I'm knocking now. And if you could just pause for a minute in your hectic lives, which I know isn't always easy, and have a listen and hear it. Ooh, I can hear knocking. Find the door, which may be completely obscured with all sorts of rubbish that you have put there. Right? And open it up. In comes Jesus. So here's the point. He wants to come in and meet with us. All right? And I think that is hugely significant. Let's have a look at the context of Revelation chapter 3. It's always important, whatever bit of the Bible you are studying, to look at the context. People say you can say anything with the Bible. Well, only if you take it out of context. If you have it in its proper context and you understand it as such, then it all hangs together absolutely perfect. Okay? Here's the context. The Lord is addressing the church in Laodicea as he's addressing six other churches, okay, with various letters. And he's dictated these letters via an angel to the Apostle John, who is sending out the letters. And you've got to think, well, what was the church in Laodicea like? I'll tell you what the church in Laodicea was like. It was rich, unlike this one. (laughs) Financially, I mean. It was rich financially. And it's all very well being financially well off with your church, but it makes you really slack. Yeah? I always say praise God when you ain't got two apenies to rub together, because then your faith kicks in. Praise God when we struggle to get on and move forward. Praise God, because it means that we have to rely on Him and not on ourselves. And I've known churches, I won't say where they are, that I've been minister of, who have got so much money in the bank that they'd forgotten to rely on God. And instead, they were running some sort of weird club that people came to for whatever purpose, that we just weren't there for Jesus. We were there because it was just kind of easy and fun and cosy. And we had no money worries at all. We just cracked on and we achieved nothing. Laodicea church was like that and so the message from God was you have got to learn to rely on me and not on all your cash reserves because that way comes destruction that's what he's saying and then because the Lord says to them look you church in Laodicea you're financially 
wealthy, that means that you, you don't really mean it anymore. You're neither hot nor cold. Yeah? You're neither full on passionate or you've not completely forgotten me. You're still a church. You're still meeting. But you've lost your passion. I, once did, uh, I was once on tour with a chap called Rob Frost. You may remember him. He was the Methodist National Evangelist. I did a lot of work with Rob Frost in the day. He was a sad loss to us, but he's in glory now. And we, we were going around touring all these Methodist churches doing various things. And we got to one somewhere. And it was a big church like this, and it was packed full of people. And I remember there was an old fellow at the back. He was, um, he was one of the church stewards. He'd been there for donkey's years, you know. And uh, we were singing, and I saw his hand go up. And I thought, bless you, brother, because I love it when your hands go up. Never feel wrong about putting your hands up in worship here at Chapel Street, folks. I know that you've done it back in the day. Maybe some of you are wary about doing it now. And how will it look? I'll tell you how it will look. It will look like we're a church that praises God. That's how it will look. If people walk in here, and they slink in and they sit at the back, which is what people do. And when we get into worship, if they see your hands go up, one, two, any way you want to do it, you know, this, carry the television, do that if you want. Yeah, you can do that one. Screw in the light bulb. I don't care. Whichever version you prefer. Yeah. If you're doing this, and I mean mean it, don't just do it because you feel you have to, you know, or everybody else is doing it, I better do it, or, you know. If we give the impression that we are truly a people of worship, if people come in and we're singing and we're actually singing, like you were just then, beautifully, they'll go, this is nice, and they'll want to stay. That's what we want, isn't it? We've got to rebuild this church post-COVID. Every church has got the same challenge. We've been hit hard by COVID. We've been knocked back. Some people have left. They've left because, as I heard our district chair put it, COVID gave an opportunity for the people who were hanging on to church by their finger ends to just let go. And they have. Other people have got really worried about this same-sex marriage thing, which I hope you've realised now is absolutely not an issue in this circuit, said the superintendent. Life goes on as normal. We will follow the Bible. But still, unfortunately, some people have left because of it. Fair enough that's what you feel you need to do therefore we need to rebuild and we've got a whole town full of people out there we've got surrounding villages and communities as well which we serve and we want them to come in and find Jesus don't we of course we flipping do right so we've got to do it so we need to be seen to be passionate about Jesus we need to be seen to be at worship we see we need to be seen to be here and I don't, I don't know because I haven't got to know you well enough yet, but I've been minister of churches sometimes where people think, well, if I come maybe once a month, that's probably enough. It's not enough. You need to be here, if at all possible. You know, some of you work, you know, odd hours and things like that, can't always get on a Sunday morning. If you're sat at home on a Sunday morning, you shouldn't be. You should be here. Why? Because it make Ralph happy? Yes, it will. it make Jesus happy. And it will make the mission of our church work. But if you turn up when you feel like it, it ain't going to work. Sorry if you're not enjoying this, but this is true. And this, is the, this was the message to Laodicea. You're neither hot nor cold. You turn up when you feel like it. You've got so much money, you don't need to worry about anything. You've lost your grip on Jesus. Your arms aren't going up in worship. You're not singing in the spirit. You're not praying in the spirit. You're not praying at all. You're just some weird club. And because you're neither hot nor cold, you're pretending to be a church, but you're not, but you've not got no passion, the Lord says, I'm going to spit you out. And the word literally translates from the Greek as vomit it's all right it's a bit more radical than spit yeah i will vomit you yeah forcibly i want nothing to do with you it's interesting i'm going to actually look at the text because that's always the best thing to do when you're preaching in revelation chapter three when i've unfolded my specs get out yeah verse 17 you say Church of Laodicea. I'm rich. I have acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. And you look at that and you go, what is that actually on about? Well, we get the bit, I am rich, I've acquired, you know, wealth. And it's talking not about individual people, it's talking about a church that was rich, financially secure, financially. And the, the, the message, the prophecy, if you like, goes on to say that you, you've got nothing, you're rubbish, you're poor, you're pitiful, you're blind, you're naked. 
And then it focuses on those three things. Buy gold refined in the fire. They were rich. They had plenty of gold. That gold you've got, says God, is worth nothing at all. You need gold refined in the fire. Spiritual gold. Faith. That's what you need. You can't buy it, but you can ask for it. You can seek Seek it out. Seek first the kingdom of God. It will be given to you and everything else that you need. That's the way around it needs to be. Buy gold from me, says God. Forget the gold you've got. That's the gold you really need. Laodicea was known for its banking, for its financial institutions. The whole city was rich. It was also known for its textiles, produced quality textiles, which is why it goes on to say, Buy white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. It's playing on the industry of the town. And also, Laodicea was known for a famous eye salve, some sort of cream or something that you put in your eyes to soothe your eyes, which is exactly why the Lord goes on to say, and why don't you get some salve from me to put on your eyes so that you can see? It's using the town's wealth and production to speak to it. That's what it means. That's the context. So don't get too hung up on I salve or anything like that. I wonder what the Lord would say to this church. What would the Lord counsel us to do? I don't know. It's worth thinking about because it might help us with a way forward. If the Lord is writing us a letter, what would he be counseling us to do. I mean, I've said a couple of things that I believe to be true. We need to be seen to be at worship. We need to be seen to be spiritually alive in our prayers, in our worship. And we need to be here in fellowship every week as much as possible. It goes on. Jesus says in verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Have you come across this in your own life? Rhetorical question. I have. <laughs> Goodness me, I have. It's like, you know, you talk about parenting and uh, they tell you not to talk about parenting in church anymore. They say, don't talk about fatherhood, motherhood, parenthood. Because so many people have had such a bad experience of motherhood, fatherhood, parenthood. And I say, yeah, but this is God. You can't have a a bad experience of God's parenthood because he, he never gets it wrong. God is the perfect parent. You want an example for parenthood? You look to God and the way that he deals with us. Look at the way he deals with us. He lets us run on, doesn't he? He lets us run on. He lets us do our own thing. He lets us make our own mistakes. And we all know that, don't we? If if those of you who've had children, as your children get older, they want to run off and do stuff. And you go, oh, no, no, no. It's a bit like if you took your children and locked them in their bedroom just to keep them safe from that dangerous world out there and just push the food under the door every, every now and again for them. That would be awful. That wouldn't be parenting. That would be imprisonment. And the Lord doesn't deal with us like that. He he lets us run on. He he tells us all the places that we should run into, the things that we should do. He gives us a complete lifestyle, a whole package of how to live a life pleasing to God. It's here in the Bible. And he says, follow that and you'll be fine. And we don't. We go off and we make our mistake. Every single one of us, we make our mistakes. We've all got a bit of the prodigal son in every single one of us. Note what God did with the prodigal son. He didn't go chasing after him down to the pig farm looking for him. He just stayed back at the ranch. And when the prodigal son had had enough and realised what an idiot he was, he came crawling back thinking that God wouldn't want him back. And God welcomed him with open arms. And that is how God deals with us. He will rebuke us and discipline us. And the way I've found more than any other that he will do this is by letting us go. And when he lets us go, he lets us go and discover what being alone is truly like. Okay? So what I say is let's not wander off. Let's not run away on our own. Let's stay close to Jesus. Be earnest, he says. Repent. If you've done something wrong, don't just say, oh, well, that's part of me now. That's who I am. That's my identity. We've talked about this. Repent. Cast it off. Cast your burdens onto Jesus. He cares for you. He wants you to do it. And then move on. And then that famous verse, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. And usually when we read that verse, we think of it in terms of each of us as individuals. And we think, all right, it's me sat in my living room. Yeah, find the door, open the door, let Jesus in, and we can hang out together. But the context here 
is of a whole church. God says to the whole church of Laodicea, listen, listen. When you hear me, open the door and I will come in, I will join your whole fellowship and I'll be at the centre of your fellowship and then we'll see things happen as they should. Now just one final thought. If you, if you identify with the people of Laodicea as they are accused of being pitiful, blind, naked and you think, well, heaven knows I'm a sinner just like they are. I've got it wrong. I've, I've not made Jesus the centre of my life. There's been times when I have. There's been times when I haven't. There's been times when I've dragged myself along to church. There's been times when I've not even bothered coming for ages. There have been times when I've really I've felt like I'm hanging on by my fingers and I've wondered why I'm doing it. There's been times I've felt really let down by the church. They haven't cared for me like they should do. Or I haven't bothered caring for them like I should do. I've made some bad decisions in my life. I reckon every single one of us in this room could say that right now. I've tried, Lord, but I and I've screwed up over and over again. And it's getting to me. And I, I, I think, are you really interested in me? Or do you want to vomit me out of your mouth? Because I'm neither hot nor cold and I'm trapped by my sin. I don't know about here in Penzance because I haven't been here long enough to get an idea of how people feel about the church. You know, people in town. But some places that I've been, many places that I've been, most places that I've been, I've encountered people out there in the community and they've said, what do you do for a living? Because I never wear my dog collar so that they can ask the question and then we can have a chat about it. And what do you do for a living? I say, I'm the Methodist minister. I go, oh. <laughs> no, not the Catholic. Not the <laughs> So, <laughs> and the Methodist minister go, oh, right, oh, 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 I don't bother going to church. I believe, you know, this is what most people say, I believe, I believe, but I, I don't go to church, you don't have to go. Anyway, you lot, you lot, them that go to church, they're all holier than thou, aren't they? That's what they say. They all think they're a bit special. I says they don't. <laughs> oh, they do, they're all, oh, they're going along to church like there's something, like there's nothing wrong in their lives. And I say, it's not like that. Church, this church, any church, it's like the doctor's waiting room. It's like the doctor's waiting room. Jesus is the doctor. We're all waiting to see Jesus. He'll call us in one at a time. But the crucial thing is we're all sick. (laughs) Something wrong in all of our lives. There has been. He's put it right. We've possibly messed up again. We're never in a situation where we can ever say, I'm sorted. But we want to be sorted. And together, we can be strong. On our own, we're nowhere. We're cold. We're lost. Together, in faith, we can be strong. We can be strong because we are together. And that's what we're going to carry forward for the rest of this year and into next year. That people might see that. And find that same hope. By the way, don't remain in your sin. Don't, don't be happy to remain in your sin any more than I am. Repent. Be earnest and repent, says Revelation 3. And receive that forgiveness. If Jesus comes in through the door and he sits in your room and he eats with you, then you've made a friend, haven't you? You've made a friend that you can go anywhere with. who will listen to all your problems. Listen to your triumphs and your sorrows, your anxieties, your anger. He'll take it all and he'll put his arm around you and say, it's okay, we can do this, I'm here for you.